Hello, I'm Rachel Carey. I'm a lecturer in food systems in the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Melbourne. We tend to think of Melbourne and Australia as being places that are food secure. So we often hear about how Australia produces enough food to feed around 60 million people, many more than we need to feed. And we often see that the supermarket shelves are generally full of food all year round. But in the last year during COVID-19 and during the 2020 bushfires, that hasn't always been the case. And sometimes we've seen images of empty supermarket shelves when there was sudden consumer demand for food and it took supermarkets a while to catch up with that demand. Or images like this one of $150,000 celery crop being dug back into the ground because of a shortage of seasonal workers to pick that crop. Or images like this one of international students who are queuing outside the town hall in Melbourne. COVID-19 has placed stress on the food system in many different ways. And it's revealed some of the cracks, some of the places that the food system is currently vulnerable. It's certainly true that we produce a lot of food. We're, we're a big food exporter. This narrative that we have about Australia being a food secure country, it masks some of those areas where the food system is more vulnerable underneath. So in fact, if people were to actually eat uh, as many vegetables as we're recommended, we wouldn't have enough vegetables to meet those needs. So I think we need to have a more nuanced conversation um, about the food system and also about how it is that we match up our food supply with the type of healthy, sustainable diet that we might want people to be consuming in future as well. So by resilience, we mean broadly that the food system is able to withstand shocks and stresses. It's also about the capacity of the food system to adapt to the changing circumstances and to transform, to build longer term resilience to future shocks and stresses. This talk draws on the findings of research project that I lead at the University of Melbourne called the Foodprint Melbourne Project. And as part of this research, what we've been doing is we've been interviewing stakeholders about how COVID-19 and the 2020 bushfires have affected the food system. And this is the region that we've been looking at. So it's an area around 100 kilometers outside of Melbourne CBD. But food growing areas in this region are at risk of urban development, of urban encroachment into farmland on Melbourne's fringe as a result of Melbourne's rapidly growing population. Climate change is leading to more frequent and more severe extreme weather events like bushfires, floods and droughts. Really, our food system has coped relatively well during these recent shocks and stresses. For the most part, most people have had access to enough good supplies of food. But the impacts of these shocks highlight some of the places that the food system is vulnerable. Some of the cracks have appeared. And these impacts include things like a decrease in the amount of some foods produced due to crop losses and livestock losses, labour shortages that can affect some types of foods being harvested, a reduction in capacity of some types of food manufacturing and processing, and disruption to supermarket distribution centres and to food freight. So the major bushfire event in early 2020 had impacts throughout the food system. And they include significant livestock and crop losses. And also smoke haze affected the productivity and yield of some types of crops. Road closures and major supply routes led to higher transport costs and forced freight and trucks to find new routes. And many people in fire affected areas experienced difficulties in accessing food, particularly vulnerable population groups. And there were widespread food relief efforts in the aftermath. There was also increased food loss and waste due to power outages. And more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has had other impacts throughout the food system. There are labour shortages on farms in Victoria. Supermarket distribution centres, abattoirs and some types of food processing and manufacturing have had their capacity reduced to around 60 to 70 percent. International and state border closures have also disrupted road and air and sea freight. We also saw, of course, demand surges in supermarkets. And there's also been an increase in food loss and waste on farm. COVID-19 has really highlighted the fragility of our existing systems of food relief for addressing widespread food insecurity during events like COVID-19. I think it was beginning to be beginning to be a shift. I think that COVID-19, for instance, has had an impact in terms of a higher level of awareness about the fact that our systems of you know, our food supply systems are more vulnerable than we might first have thought. That for the first time, some of us have seen empty supermarket shelves or have, you know, been aware that we're not always able to get the food that we want when we want it. And I think that's been a bit of a wake up call. So it's really about, you know, looking to the future, thinking about the stresses that we're likely to face and saying, what can we do now? What actions should we take now to ensure that we have a secure food supply? what is still a rapidly growing city. 
So what do these experiences of bushfires and COVID-19 tell us about the features of a food system that's likely to be resilient into the future? There are limits to our ability now to plan for all eventualities. And so it's important that we start to take actions that are going to build the resilience of the food system, no matter what type of shock or stress comes along next. So our research suggests that a more resilient food system is likely to have a number of key features. One is that the system is likely to be diverse. Resilient food supply chains are also adaptive and they're innovative, and we saw this during COVID-19. The pandemic's also highlighted the risk of centralised supermarket distribution centres and processing facilities. Our interviewees have also emphasised how important networks and collaboration are at all levels to more resilient food systems. Existing networks of stakeholders that are built on relationships of trust enable quick responses and enable rapid adaptation when disasters happen. So what types of no regrets actions and policies might we want to build the resilience of the food system for the longer term? One is that we need to rebuild regional and local food supply chains. We're incredibly lucky in Melbourne that we are situated within a highly productive food bowl. It's really important that we now protect the farmland and the natural water resources that are on the city fringe as well. Another opportunity to strengthen the resilience of Melbourne's food system is to build circular food economies that close the loop and use natural resources efficiently by reusing city waste on local farms. Another way is to promote resilient and sustainable production systems that don't rely heavily on external inputs like synthetic fertilisers and fossil fuels and that are well adapted to the impacts of climate change. A resilient food system is likely to draw on many diverse types of sustainable farming approaches, each adapted to different contexts. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket and betting on just one type of sustainable farming approach for the future. It's really important to, for a more resilient food system that we're able to source food from different, different types of sources. So obviously, national food supplies are really important. Global food supplies are also important. And in fact, food prices would have risen much more in Australia during the millennium drought than they did if we weren't importing food. So that's a really important part of our food system. But I think that we've relied on those longer food supply chains quite heavily and we've neglected um, the importance of our short local and regional food supply chain. So it's really important now to start to fill that gap, to start to rebuild those local regional food supply chains. And of course, there are multiple benefits that we can get from that as well, including, of course, economic benefits and supporting local farmers. Another opportunity to build resilience in the food system is to address insecure employment, low wages and poor working conditions in the food industry. Most importantly, there's an urgent need to redesign systems of food relief so that all Victorians have access at all times to a healthy, sustainable and culturally appropriate diet. If we accept that one of the most basic goals of the food system should be to ensure that everyone has access to enough healthy and sustainably produced food, then it's fair to say the current food system is failing. An important part of resetting that system is for governments at all levels to recognise access to appropriate food as a fundamental human right and to examine their role in ensuring that all citizens are able to realise that right and also to realise that right through shocks and stresses to the food system. And lastly, many interviewees in our research highlighted that COVID-19 is a transformational moment with potential for deep systemic change for our food system as in many other areas of our lives if we leverage the opportunities. So how should we seize this moment to redesign our food system so that it's resilient in the face of increasing shocks and stresses and so that it achieves its most basic and fundamental purpose of ensuring that everybody at all times has access to enough healthy, culturally appropriate and sustainably produced food. I think the one thing that we really like people, everybody to understand is just to recognise that we are living in a perhaps a less certain environment than we have in the past. You know, we, I think we all recognise that we are, there are more shocks and stresses that are affecting many different aspects of our lives, climate related shocks that are already here. You know, we're seeing them. And I think some of the most important things that we'd really like to see is just that we ensure that we protect the land, protect the water resources on the fringe of Melbourne, ensure that we are no longer, um, no longer moving into areas of highly productive soil to build housing estates. It just doesn't make sense from a long-term point of view. Locally produced food is just one part of 
a more resilient food system. But it is a part that we've neglected in the past. And I think it makes sense to focus a lot more on that in the future.